So we try to sort of provide uh, consistent information anywhere they look so you can get that full picture of the project. Um, somebody did not request TABA funds. That's leaving money on the table. Um, always request TABA funds. They're, they're there for, for the taking. Also, a uh, quick difference between key personnel and other. Besides the technical scope of those two different uh, roles, if somebody is other personnel, you do not have the opportunity to attach their biosketch. And so anybody that contributes to the project in a way that you want the reviewers to see their qualifications, uh, they need to be under key personnel or um, a consultant or advisor. I think that's it. All right, and then here oh, is I'm the- I'm sorry, I was gonna say one more thing. Oh. I think what people mean when they said co-PI, they might actually mean co-investigator, um, which is a very common uh, um, title in the proposal when uh, co-PI is not, but co-investigator is. And this that was the sample of the budget justification. The next slide. All right, so there's the budget justification. And that's, a, that's for a phase two, so it shows two years, so just ignore that part. All right, and then Chris, were you going to uh, get started on letters of support? Uh, still muted. Um, do you want to go over, these are your points here. Okay, yeah. Uh, you know, letter of support is not a boilerplate template that you just get somebody to sign and check off. Every writer will have a unique relationship with the company. Every writer will have a unique relationship with the marketplace. They'll have a unique understanding of the market potential. They will have a unique impact on the market. Uh, and that you, you need in your letter of support to reflect that uniqueness, what they bring that no one else brings, what commitment they will give to your project. And what you want to avoid in a letter of support is anything that just sounds like pleasant applause from the sideline. Uh, you can get those very easily. They carry very little weight. So if you see things like, you know, this is a uh, we will watch eagerly. We support this effort. We think it is really good. We realize that you're very dedicated. That kind of uh, information isn't going to carry as much weight as the unique characteristics and relationships of the individual. Okay, Chris. Uh, just make sure those letters are dated. Um, and you do need to have a signature. It can be an electronic signature, um, like a, a qualified electronic signature, but they do need to be signed. Um, they should be addressed to the company and written in that voice to the company. Okay, and I've got some examples here of sort of generic uh, wording that's weak and a little more specific wording that's strong. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, if you just say in a letter, we will watch progress eagerly, that really doesn't say anything. But if the letter of support writer says, we will actively participate, here's what we will do, here are the resources we will contribute, here's the time we're going to dedicate, here are the facilities we will make available, that's much stronger. If you say generically, oh, this will have a great benefit to humanity, you know, that carries some weight, I suppose, but it's much stronger if you say exactly what this will do and why. It will save lives by reduce, or making drugs more available. It will reduce time to market by increasing the efficacy of drugs. It will increase uh, our ability to uh, demonstrate proficiency in drugs. It will eliminate a virus. Uh, you know, be specific how this is going to do the great things. And then if you just say in general has significant market potential, that really isn't very well supported. You want to say what specifically it will do and the letter of supporter letter of support writer should say why that person or that company wants the product. This means a lot to us because we will make money if we include it in our product line or a clinic. This means a lot to us because we are losing patients now and we will be able to retain those patients. We will save their lives if we have this technology. Specific reasons why that letter of support writer wants it rather than just bland statements about significant market potential. All right, last letters of support. Let's look ahead to the team readiness. I had a few comments here. Um, I noticed in general, teams say, well, we need to get traction and then we'll be able to raise capital. And to a certain extent that's true, but you probably will need capital a little earlier than it sounds like you're expecting it in the readiness checklist. So think in terms of, yes, you're gonna need some capital early on in order to gain traction. So just be aware that you're gonna need capital early on. Um, people 
seem to have a good understanding that you will need some technical and financial assistance that you don't have right now. The one big gap that I saw undocumented was presence in the field though. You will need someone who really understands logistics, operations, marketing, uh, distribution, manufacturing, how things really work in the marketplace, how you negotiate the complex ecosystem to get products made and to get them to market. And so make sure you're aware that you, you will need some experience in the field and you'll have to get that somehow on your team and it will need to be central to the team. Hiring a consultant is a good step, but it's probably not enough. You need someone central to the team who can have that experience. I'll also mention that uh, in my work, uh, about half of my work is helping people obtain SBIR awards. The other half is helping small startups get started as a company. So I do finance, I do reporting, I do government compliance, I do audit reviews, I do payroll, I do all of this stuff. So I'm available um, to help with how to set up a company after on or after you get started. And I will agree that yes, you do need assistance in these areas. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Chris. I have a question about that. Do you do the initial setup, like the chart of accounts and can you yes. do that? Okay. Yes, yeah. That's critical. I think that's critical because if you get started without being set up properly, then you're cleaning up a mess. So just checking. Right, you remember from the budget session, I talked about indirect rates and setting up your chart of accounts to support indirect rates. You can do it so that they're much easier to calculate if you do it right up at the beginning. So get some help up front, make sure they're set up properly. All right, Chris. Okay, um, when you think about your team, um, I used to use the analogy of a pie and think about sort of uh, the, the importance of each role and then making sure you fill up your pie. So there's the role of the scientific or the person who has sort of the technical knowledge, there's the person who has market knowledge, there's the person who has pay or knowledge, um, all different types of roles. Uh, one team that's a really good example is AdGraph, where they're developing a technology for use in the addiction space. And so um, while they're really great researchers on the technology and understanding um, the biological response to addiction, they probably need to have somebody on their team, even as an advisor, who treats people for addiction um, to sort of understand how those tools are distributed in that, that marketplace. Um, also, uh, this is so small, but I keep saying this, Always, 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 any opportunity you have, organize your thoughts by company first. Always lead with the company, company everything, then sub award, then the other, uh, you know, consultants, advisors, whatever. But this is a company grant. So always lead with the company. Everybody else falls under the company. All right. Any questions about the assignments? Any questions related to the assignments? Hey, Roland. Uh, I have a specific question about the letters of support. Should All right. That now or? Uh, what is your question? Um, I had a question about the letters of support. Can I ask that now or should I? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I was just uh, wondering how would we like, so we can have a max of three letters of support, but I was wondering how should we differentiate them if essentially we're getting the same thing from each um, farmer or for in my case it's going to be farmers so I'm wondering how should I try to differentiate because they might all look very similar I'm not sure if that's going to be an issue or if, um, yeah that might be specific enough that I we should talk to you in office hours so make there's sure no in your particular on, case how to differentiate that. But Chris, go ahead. There's no limit on letters of support for NIH. That's NSF only. Yeah. Right. You know, when I said three, that's an NSF limit, not an NIH limit. Um, there is no limit for NIH. In general, uh, you know, I usually direct people to get about three. Yeah. Okay, yeah, no, I see. Um, yeah, I think I'll can talk to you. Specifically yeah, yeah, make sure because it sounds like a specific case. Um, and we'll be glad to address that. Okay, awesome. All right, anything else? I also had a quick question about budgeting if uh, oh, yeah. um, okay. So is there like I know we're going to set up our budgets of this is what we're planning to use for this and whatnot. But after acceptance, is there any, I guess, changes we can make to the what we're gonna 
if we have any changes in um that we come across for budgeting and stuff oh, obviously yeah. things might not go as planned so how yeah, would that I'm, work i'm glad you asked that question because that's a good point when you're there are several areas where you can change the budget uh, sure. when you're selected for an award you will often be uh, requested to submit a revised budget sometimes they'll have a problem with your budget and they'll say this needs to be changed or if there's a change at that time when you're selected for an award before you get the award you can usually revise the budget at that time in fact sometimes they, they demand it during the course of the project if things have changed significantly then you can request a budget justification with the program officer. Hmm. However, everybody expects that this is a budget and not set in stone. This is a research project, things will change. And so you're allowed a certain amount of variance with, within the budget without any question. The rule of thumb is about 10%. If any budget line varies by less than 10%, it's not even worth mentioning. That's noise, it doesn't matter. And so you've got, you know, several levels of change and you will be able to modify the budget it is not set in stone okay i'm Great. glad you brought that up clear this all right great. oh there was another question yes yeah can i ask a quick question about uh letters also and uh, first of all what kind of letters or what kind of people's for uh writing letters for sbir sttr from an edge perspective for other grant we know it's like our one grant we know we need to experts in this research field but uh, for the sbr uh, stdr do they're looking for some people from company or for, from private investigator or something not as a scientific field person to write it support a letter we had a slide on that uh, last week were you were you with us last week yeah, yeah, was there, but okay. I didn't really catch that. <laughs> it has different buckets of letters of support that that you should get. So um, you can get it from from uh, KOLs or um, you know potential beneficiaries or investors. There's all different kinds of buckets. Yeah. Second question is how to find those people. Well, you know, okay. all, already, yeah. You should be connected already. You've got a network of individuals. You're, you're playing in the marketplace. You have a presence in the marketplace. You have partners in the marketplace. And the ones who can help validate the marketplace and attest to the value of the technology that you're developing, the ones with the biggest impact, these are the ones who are going to help you out the most with letters of support. Thanks, Scott. Okay. All right, let's move ahead. Technology readiness levels. This is a convenient and often used way of demonstrating the readiness of the technology. These nine different levels are recognized by anybody who's, who's in the industry. And a technology readiness level of one is very low. That means it's basic research. You sort of have an idea that some technology is worth investigating, but uh, you're not sure even if it has an application yet all the way up to level nine, which is the product is done, it's in the marketplace and people are using it. And so you've got these various technology readiness levels as defined here. And with the SBIR program at a phase one level, you wanna hit a technology readiness level somewhere between three and five. It's out of the lab, it may have been prototyped, you maybe have a publication or two, you're beginning to see a direct application. You know that it's going to be useful in a product or you think it probably will be useful in a product. You've tested it maybe in a limited situation. Those are the levels that you really go for in an SBIR phase one proposal. In a phase two proposal, you might go for a little higher level because they expect the technology to be a little bit further along in phase two. So this is a convenient uh, nomenclature to use when you're filling out your readiness checklist. You can think in terms of TRLs. Are you at a level three, four, or five if you're doing a phase one proposal? You can get a more detailed list in the table here that's in the notes. So feel free to go ahead and look at that if you want more detailed levels. In general though, here are some other areas to consider when you are working with your technology readiness. Some good tests of whether you're innovative enough to be um, eligible for the SBR pr proposal are these. Do you really advance the scientific knowledge? 
Uh, is it protectable of intellectual property? Uh, how risky is it? NSF or the SBR, uh, not just NSF, but the SBR program is looking for levels of uncertainty and risk. If you're absolutely certain it's going to work, there's no risk. It's never, it's, that's obviously been done before. There's no for, need for SBIR money. Can you get a publication out of it? What level of expertise does it take? And uh, does this improve upon work that's in the field now? The point here is, you know, when you're talking about significance and your innovation, it's good in your proposal to mention other leading work in the field and to cite them in your bibliography to show that you are in fact aware of everything else that's going on and you're doing something that no one else has done before. And when you talk to the program officer or program manager, you can get feedback on whether the level of information or the level of technology is an appropriate level for SBIR. Now, so far, everybody in this sprint is at a pretty good level based on the information that we've received. So I don't really need to harp on this, but these are good tests to keep in mind when you're thinking about your technology and how to pitch it in the proposal. And so the level of specific, the level of technology is something you include as a basis for your specific aims. It's a guidance for what you're going to accomplish in your proposal that builds on existing work that is new, that is innovative, and I will now unshare my screen and turn it over to Shelly because she will talk about specific aims and the rest of the session. Yay, thanks, Ron. Let me just get this up here. There. Okay, so switching over to looking at the specific aims. So looking at the specific sections for your proposal. The specific aims is essentially, it's, it's your one page overview of your whole proposal. So it's the summary of all of your proposal. You need to have um, the significance, the innovation and the approach kind of all in there in an abbreviated version. Um, you're only given a page, so you need to be succinct, but make it compel compelling. You want the reviewers to want to read this. They've got a lot of applications to scan through, but specific aims is kind of where they go, go to get the heart of your proposal, so make it compelling. You want to be specific about your problem and your approach. I really like the mnemonic when I'm working on these SBIR grants of SMART. So you want them to be specific, measurable, attainable, uh, relevant, and time-based. So kind of keep that in mind as you're putting together your specific aims and that'll help you kind of keep focused. Um, looking more specifically at how I suggest laying out your specific aims, I generally start with a paragraph about the significance. So what is the problem? How are uh, you addressing it? Be fairly specific about it. You know, what specific area of it are you looking at? What are the current treatments and solutions for it? What are their strengths and weaknesses? Um, so you're setting it up for then a paragraph two about your product. How is it innovative? How are you gonna advance where they're currently at? Um, what problems does it solve that uh, our current roadblocks or others aren't able to? And then you get into the heart of it. So these are your specific aims. These are your research objectives of what you're proposing in this project. You wanna keep it in mind, you're, you're wanting to show feasibility. That's your goal. That's your overall end point of this is to show feasibility so that you can move on to phase two and you can move your product towards commercialization. On average, I usually recommend around two to four, but you know, however that breaks out for you so that you get your specific research objectives to focus on what you need to prove feasibility. Um, you wanna call them out in your specific aims, enumerate them, set them apart, make them easily readable so somebody can pick it up and easily see what you're proposing to do. Um, you want them to be easily reviewable. So keep a lot of the specific jargon out of the specific aims part. You can expand on that later in your approach and your methods, but make them readable so that somebody doesn't have to go look up what your acronyms are or what your specific you know, jargon that you're using is. Um, you also really want these to be endpoint goals. 
So when I say that, a lot of you are coming from an academic side where you're used to doing basic research, you're used to exploring, investigating, understanding basic principles. Now you need to put on your SBIR hat and you're focused on your commercialization of your products. So you want these all to be very specific. So for instance, I'm saying, you would say select the best drug candidate for uh, phase two from optimized peptides, as opposed to evaluating a number of optimized peptides. It's a slight difference, but it just makes it more focused and uh, more of an endpoint goal. And that's where you wanna be at for this. Um, you wanna include a timeline for each of the aims, how long you think each section is gonna take you. Um, definitely do not propose more work than is reasonable to achieve in this. I've seen that with a number of teams where they propose, you know, a lot of objectives or objectives that are clearly going to take a long time to achieve and they get feedback accordingly that this isn't reasonable um, and therefore they kind of question their ability to plan experiments because if they're saying that they can do something in a year that clearly is going to take two years to do they're not gonna review that favorably. So don't propose more work than is feasible to do in the timeline for the grant. Um, you do wanna talk about what your outcome would be of a successful project. So what would be the end result? If, if your work goes as expected, what's your outcome gonna be? Where are you gonna be at? What's your expected result? Um, and then you wanna talk about a brief uh, couple of next steps of how this project fits into the overall commercialization of your product. So kind of where you're at along the pathway and just give a brief overview of that. Um, that is kind of the heart of the specific aims. And those are, um, like I said, just the overview of your whole proposal in one succinct page. So I guess I'll pause and see if there was any questions before I move on to the research strategy. I can't see the chat, so. Nothing in chat, but um, I don't know if anybody wants to unmute and ask a question. Okay. Well, if you have questions, you can put them in and I will address them later. Um, okay. Something to keep in mind throughout your whole proposal as you're writing it is the five review criteria that the reviewers are gonna to use to score your, your application. I think we're gonna talk more about the review process next week, but I always tell people to keep these in mind as you're writing so that you've addressed all the different areas. You don't wanna leave anything up to questions. So you'll be scored in significance, in investigators, so basically your team and who's gonna be doing the research, innovation, the approach, your overall scientific approach for doing it, and the environment, which is just kind of the facilities and if you have access to everything you need in order to carry out the research. So as you're writing your whole proposal, keep all of these in mind and make sure they're all being addressed in various portions of your proposal. Um, so that brings us to the research strategy. So the overall meat of your proposal here, you get six pages. I'm gonna tell you right off the top that it's hard to fit everything you need to say into the six pages. It's gonna take some editing, you have to be succinct. If you've only had like five pages and you think you've covered everything, you've probably missed something because it is typically really hard to make sure everything you need to cover has been done in the six pages. Um, make sure you follow all the formatting rules. There, you can read about them, but there are specific formatting guidelines. If you don't follow those, they're not even gonna review your application. And that's really sad if you put all the work into it. Um, it helps because you are only allowed the six pages to have a good outline with what you're going to put into each section so that you cover everything and aren't repeating yourself twice so that you're not giving up precious space to get everything in. There are three sections that the NIH requires. So it's significance, innovation, and approach. You want to use those specific three headings in, uh, in your proposal. You can use whatever subheadings you want, um, make them make the formatting of that consistent through the application, but use strong subheadings if you're gonna use subheadings to break up things. Um, I gave a rough outline of page numbers. It doesn't have to be exactly this. It's, you know, some teams are 
stronger, like they have a completely new innovative method that they've used. And so they're gonna spend a little bit longer on innovation than maybe another team. Some teams have a lot of preliminary data they're gonna cover. So maybe their approach is gonna be longer, but this is just kind of a guideline that I generally give for uh, formatting your, your research strategy. Um, so the first section is significance. And you're going to want to talk about the importance of the health, of public health problem that you're addressing. What is the problem you're addressing? Be specific. What specific aspect of it are you looking to solve? Are you decreasing death rates? Are you giving a better quality of life, more efficient, decrease health care? You know, whatever aspect of it that you're addressing, make sure you're clearly making it, um, you're, you're making it clear which aspect you are addressing. Then you're gonna to wanna to cover the current solutions to the problem, the current state of the market. You can't be completely exhaustive because again, you only have six pages, but make sure you've included all of the major relevant research. Uh, first of all, you never know who's gonna be on your review panel. And I actually had a client who unfortunately missed somebody that was in a phase two clinical trial that was, um, really relevant to a, com a competing technology. And their reviewer was on the advisory board of that company. And needless to say, their review didn't go very well because he wasn't very <laughs> excited about being left out. So you wanna be fairly comprehensive here, you know, put in the publications, you can cite them all in your bibliography at the end, but, but make sure you're covering everything that's out there. Cause again, you don't know who's gonna be on it. Um, you want to show the current limitations of what's out there and uh, what would be needed to advance that current state so that you're setting yourself up for how your innovation is going to address some of the current limitations and where you can go from there. You also want to include just like a brief uh, paragraph or so of the commercialization. Commercialization strategy or plan is not actually required by the NIH for phase one. But you do want to include a paragraph or so of where you fit into the marketplace and you know where you're going. They do want to see that you have an understanding. And you will need your commercialization plan when you get to phase two. Um, so the next section is innovation. You want to show in here, highlight anything that makes your product innovative. Whatever it is that you're addressing that is moving the market along, make sure you're highlighting all of those features. Also make sure you're highlighting, if you have any unique resources to solve this problem, if you've developed a new technology platform and you're using that to solve the current problem, make sure you highlight that you have that unique technology platform that isn't available anywhere else. Um, you don't need excessive method details here. You're just gonna be highlighting what is innovative about yours. You'll save the methods for the approach, but make sure you are highlighting so it's easily they can easily see what's innovative. This is where your reviewers will go to see what's innovative about your technology. You also, this is the section where you would wanna mention any IP protections that you currently have. Okay, then you get into the approach, which spells out your research plan. I always tell people to start with preliminary results. Um, they're technically not required by the NIH, so they say, but they are extremely helpful. And a lot of reviewers have a basic expectation of some preliminary results. So if you have them, they are definitely helpful. So I would definitely say to include those. Shelly, oh, yeah. can, I, can I ask you, in my experience, I, I've never had a client get funded without preliminary results, have you? No, I've yeah. never had one. I have had a couple of try and they tried with publications to support their idea, but they did not get funded. Nope. Yeah. So while they say they're not required, I have never seen that. <laughs> so I would highly, highly encourage preliminary data. However, one thing I do want to caution you on, when I say poorly presented data can hurt your score, I had a client who they did an experiment just as they were putting together their proposal and it showed a unique um, advantage that they had, but it was an unexpected result and they didn't have the correct controls for that experiment. So there were could have been multiple interpretations of that data. They ended up getting dinged because they didn't do the controls and they were taking this as this was an experiment to test this out. So then in their whole approach, they were questioning everything because they were questioning whether they were capable of setting up proper experiments. 
So don't put in data that isn't ready to be published, but you know, it, put in all of your preliminary data that you have. You can include published data or your unpublished data that's ready. Um, you want anything that's going to support your feasibility. You also want to emphasize if you have similar work to what you're proposing, a similar technique, sometimes that helps because it shows that you are the competent team to perform this research, that you have the, the technical ability. Um, good figures and graphs are always a good thing. If you're, you can put in a figure or a graph that would take you a paragraph to describe, that's a good use of space. And um, I think it's awful, often helpful for them to see. Um, and then the experimental design. So this is your research objectives for each of your specific aims. You're gonna lay out your methods, your expected outcomes. You also wanna discuss any potential problems that could arise and alternative approaches that you could use if you had it, potential problems. Basically, you're gonna head off some of the reviewers' critiques. You know, If they can easily see where a problem could arise and you can already address that, that's always gonna help you. Um, if there's statistical analysis needed, you want to describe what kind of statistical analysis you would need and justify that. Um, you want to have a success criteria for each aim. You want to make it easy to set up your phase two proposal. So if you can show, okay, for this particular aim, if we get this result, you know, this will show feasibility, you need some criteria to be able to do that. So make sure you have criteria for each one. Um, you want to make it clear what role the collaborators are playing. So this, you know, when you're describing your methods, you don't want to be describing, you know, really expensive instrumentation that you don't have in your particular company. If you're collaborating with a university and that's giving you access to that, make it clear that, you know, you have, you have access to this through your collaborator. Um, Justify, uh, oh, you want to describe any new methods in enough detail for reviewers to understand. If, if it's something that's not readily published, make sure you've made it clear what your method is so that they can properly review it. And you also want to um, justify sample size and uh, parameters, especially if you're doing animal models or human subjects. Justify why you're using, you know, this many number or why you're using, you know, any of the parameters for it. You, you need to make sure that they understand the parameters of your subjects that you're picking. Um, you wanna include a timeline, like I said before, for how long each of the specific aims are gonna take and you know, what process that's gonna be. And then you would wanna include a brief discussion of what comes next. So if the phase one is successful, what are you looking to do in phase two? So, um, just giving them a clear pathway to make them understand that you have thought about this more than just your initial feasibility studies. I think that's the last one I have on research strategy. So I will pause here if there's any questions. While we're pausing, I'll just add one thing and that's it's useful in the research strategy approach section to show risks and mitigations, to show a plan A and a plan B. You present your approach as if here's the number one route that we're going to take. But if it doesn't work, here's what we'll do instead. If that doesn't work, here's what we'll do instead. So show that you're aware of risks and you've got some plans in place to mitigate those risks and some alternatives in case plan A doesn't work out. Yeah, I completely agree. And what I said was that you want to do that for each of your aims. So if something doesn't work in that aim, how could you address it alternatively? Yep, I absolutely agree. Is there any questions? Uh, no questions in the chat. Uh, anybody want to unmute and ask a question? Okay. Um, so this is the first assignment and um, this is the draft of your specific aims. So um, I don't, is there specifics you want to mention about this, Roland? No, it should be pretty much self-explanatory, um, except that in the uh, module section, there is a, a, a template that Chris put together and you can refer to that template. You can work from it or you can create your own documents. It's there as a tool if it, if it might help you. And then the second one is just your work plan outline. Just make sure when you're doing this, you have the different sections and what would go in each section. I know you guys kind of had an outline before, but 
you know, keeping the different sections in mind and what you're going to put in each of the sections will help you when you get ready to write this. Oh yeah, and to clarify here, what, what, what we're looking for in the assignment is an outline specifically of the approach section of the research strategy. If you wanna go ahead and outline the significance and innovation section, great, feel free, we'll give you comments on that, but we're really looking for details on the approach section since it describes in more detail how you will accomplish the specific aims. Um, so next I have strong abstracts. I put this last for a reason because that's when I always do it. If you've written your entire specific names, the abstract should be easy to write because it's basically just a concise summary of your specific aims page. You get 30 lines for your abstract um, and you're just gonna address basically all of the things you addressed in your specific aims, except just take out a couple of brief sentences from each of them. So you're gonna address your specific or your significance and innovation. You're gonna spell out your specific aims and a general statement about where you're gonna go from there. Keep in mind that this is published if your grant is awarded. So it will be public. So, um, and I think I say this in the next one, but no IP at all in the abstract because it will be published. It is read by all the reviewers. Um, so you do wanna make the language easily understandable to any scientifically literate uh, audience. Um, I guess I must put it later. But um, so that's, you know, the basic just summary of your specific aims is what your abstract is. So then going on to that, um, is the IP protection. And like I said, your abstract is published, so no IP in that. But your whole application, the reviewers have agreed to treat your proposals confidentially. So what you can do to protect your IP is you can mark anything proprietary in the application. Um, there's a legend. I actually put the legend from the NIH in here. So that's the statement that you wanna use and then mark any sections that contain any of your IP. Um, you're not allowed to mark your entire proposal. So that would be for specific sections where you're clearly describing your IP. You can't say the whole thing is just confidential. <laughs> they won't let you. That's one of my favorites. Uh, the whole thing. I'm like, oh, really? like <laughs> it's all your company was founded is proprietary. You know? right. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. <laughs> um, then you need to go and your r and form and the other project information, you need to check the, the box that says contains proprietary information if you're gonna add that. Um, the other thing that you can do is you are allowed to suggest individuals or institutions to either review or not to review your proposal. So that's something to keep in mind. It's kind of a strategy uh, idea that you can think about, but you are allowed to do that. There's a, a specific form that you can fill out to do that. Um, like I said, the abstracts are public. Whenever possible, leave the IP out of the proposal. If you can convey everything you need to say without specifically addressing, but you know, sometimes that's not possible, so you can't always do that. But if it is possible, then don't put it in. Um, also, just for general information, because we had a conversation and Roland had said there were some questions he had gotten before, but keep sensitive IP in general out of any initial information that's meant for outside presentation. You can always do things to protect it with further conversations, but if you're going to talk to a potential investor, in your initial pitch to them, don't put the IP in. You can worry about protecting it later, but keep it out of all initial material. Um, so the next section we're kind of calling phase one to phase two. This isn't specific to your phase one proposal, but this is something to give you a good idea of where you should be thinking about and where you should be heading. Because I've had, and I think uh, most of us who have worked with companies, had companies that we've worked with and they got their phase one proposal and then they go to their phase two and, and they haven't really always thought about everything that they need to prepare to go along the pathway. So this is just some things that you should be thinking about to help you know where you should be going. And also, you know, I use the analogy, we don't want to fund a bridge that's going nowhere. So great, you have this initial technology and you're looking at the feasibility, but if you don't have a plan of where you're going to take it, you're kind of on a bridge to nowhere. You need to have in mind where you're eventually wanting to go and what kind of things you're going to need to get there. 
So some of those include looking at regulatory pathways. You kind of need to know where your um, your product is going to fit into the regulatory pathway. Is it a new drug? Are you going to have to look at uh, an investigative new drug uh, application? Is it a medical device? And then there's different regulatory pathways that you can choose from to follow for a medical device. A uh, lot. Keep in mind that a lot of the software gets included in the medical devices. So. You just kind of need to know where you're fit in. It could be a combination project or it could be um, an in vitro diagnostic. So figure out where your product is going to fit into the regulatory pathway and what kind of thing you're gonna need. Um, one of the things that I say is a lot of times if you look, you can get extra information out of an experiment that you're doing that you weren't thinking about the regulatory requirements you're gonna need down the future, but it wouldn't take much to add just you know, an extra assay on or something that would provide you information you're going to need to support some of your um, regulatory requirements coming up. So if you know what pathway you're on and thinking about that down the line, you can plan ahead to get, you know, better use out of your experiments. Um, then you also want to start thinking about your commercialization strategy. Um, we kind of were talking about this before, but where, what is your eventual commercialization goal? Are you planning on bringing this product to market yourself? Then you need to know what kind of expertise you're gonna to need to bring in. You're gonna to need to bring in formulations and uh, manufacturing and marketing, and you'll need to know what kind of pieces you need to bring in. Are you looking at developing a strategic partnership? So then you need to be looking at what kind of partners you wanna be looking at that, that would then help you with some of the manufacturing and uh, some of the uh, aspects you're gonna need down the road. Uh, are you looking at licensing or just being an acquisition of your company? So you kind of need to have in mind what your commercialization strategy is so that you can plan accordingly for what you're gonna need as you go on. You also wanna know how much time and investment each milestone is gonna take. You can plan out your budget for this initial feasibility study, but as you go on, it's gonna take more and more of an investment to move your product along. So you need to be planning for that as far as what kind of investments you'll need and what kind of partners you'll need and how you're gonna overall do that. So it's just things to keep in mind and be thinking about as you're moving along. And I think that's the end of my material. So if there's questions. Yeah, uh, Taha just asked a question that uh, is related to the point I was gonna bring up. His question is, should we be mentioning all these points in the phase one proposal? Is it mainly for our benefit for the phase two proposal? And that's what I was gonna mention is that uh, it's always a question what to put about your phase two proposal in phase one. Uh, a common mistake that I see is that people will write about phase one and phase two in phase one, and they won't clearly differentiate what the goals of the phase one proposal are and what the goals of the phase two proposal are. So my response, Taha, is you make sure at least in your phase one proposal, you say clearly, here's what we will accomplish in phase one. But Shelly, what advice do you give people about how much phase two information to put in the phase one proposal? So I don't put a lot of phase two in, but I do always like at the end of your approach, where are you going next? What would be the plans for phase two? Just a brief paragraph, letting them know that you've thought about it and that you thought and, and that kind of goes for like the whole process. If they clearly can read from your application that you've thought about the future, that you're not just planning for this experiment, that that's really what you want to convey at this point. So I don't go into a ton of detail, but I, I do recommend a paragraph of an overview of what you plan to do next in phase two. Just as an aside, some agencies with longer applications specifically have a section for how the phase one results lead to phase two. NIH in six pages doesn't have that, but that's the SBIR mindset is that your goal in phase one is to get the phase two proposal. So you wanna set everything up so that at the end of the phase one, people will review your final report and say, here's what they said they were gonna do. They did it, it's clear. So phase two is pretty much automatic. Yep. And that goes along with setting criteria for success for each of your specific aims. You right. wanna show them, it sets you up so much easier to write a phase two if you can say, well, I met all of these criteria for my phase one aims. 
Therefore, I'm ready to proceed to phase two. All right, any other questions? Because that's the bulk of the uh, presentation content. I'm gonna go over a couple assignments and what's coming up next. But uh, if you have any, any other questions on the content, make sure and ask them now. You can unmute or put in the chat. I'll just pause for a little bit to see if there are any. I just wanna add how lucky I think this group is to hear the perspective of three different people because there isn't, there's like 12 ways to skin this cat, right? And so what you're getting are all these different approaches and methods that we practitioners use and you can pick and choose what you want to, to use, what feels right to you based on your uh, circumstances, but it's such a unique perspective. Yeah, I agree. I wish this kind of advice was out there way back when I wrote my first proposal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It wasn't, so I was kind of going blind, so. <laughs> All right, there's, there's one other point that, um that I'll make, and that's regarding TABA. Chris, you had mentioned that not requesting TABA is leaving money on the table, and I'm not so sure that's the case, because if you if you request the $6,500, that comes out of work that you could otherwise apply to direct, so you're not getting any additional. The $6,500 has to come out of the total. If you request direct, you're not asking for any more, and if you uh, don't ask for the, the specific TABA, NIH has default uh, support that they will give you so you you can avail yourself of their uh, services but remember there's no hard cap in nih so there's no reason not to ask for um i think that you and i have different different approaches on the nih budget um i tend to be um i rarely use this word about myself but liberal um in, in my approach to the nih budget um because budget is always negotiated at time of award and if you read the NIH guidelines carefully, they tell you, and, and any workshop I've ever been put on by NIH about budget tells you to ask for what you need because budget is negotiated at time of award. And what reviewers look at on your budget when they're reviewing your proposal is, is the, propo is the budget consistent for the work proposed? That's their question. Um, and so um, there, there is no hard cap. Now there are guidelines set, but they are simply that, they are guidelines. It's not like NIH where there's that hard cap. So it is, if, in my mind, you should ask for anything you want. Now your, your project has to be within the scope of a phase one. So you can't ask for a million dollars for three years because that's not a phase one. Um, but I'd say the average phase one that I put in is, is nearing 300,000. Have you ever had uh, NIH come back and request less because they thought the budget was too great, either Chris always. or Shelley? They, yeah, they, always, they always do. They always do. So that's why okay. you should start and ask for what you need because you're going to have to come down. If you they think something to. is out of line, they will definitely come back to you and tell you to reduce it. That, my point is they're not going to not fund you. If they like the science, they will come to you. And that's what I always see the goal of, of careful proposal preparation is, is to create a proposal where reviewers can focus on the science because that's what wins a proposal is good science, good technology. And then if they like that, then the budget is secondary and they'll come back to you and say, hey, we really like this, we wanna fund it, let's work on the budget. Yeah, that, that is a main point. And that's if NIH likes your project, they will support you and work with you to get it funded. Yep. They'll find a way to do that. I've seen that time and time again. Uh, let's see, Weeping asks uh, uh, for commercialization plan templates. Uh, this is a phase two question because you don't submit a commercialization plan in phase one. And it's also kind of iffy. I'm always reluctant to provide any kind of a template for the commercialization plan because everybody's situation is so unique that uh, if you try and fit a format or a template, you might be distorting your story. And the goal is really to tell your story and your role as appropriate to your situation. Yeah, but, I, uh, yeah I'll, I'll leave that open to others as well then. I agree. I, I don't like to work from a template for that because it really it does depend on what your commercialization strategy is and where, you know, where you're at. It's, it is pretty unique to everyone. I don't know if you use a template for that, Chris, but. I do, um, but but there's a lot of, uh, like you said, customization to that. The template is a place for people to start. 
Um, but every story is very different in the commercialization plan. Yeah. Guys, I'll I also say off. that you. Oh, I'm I gotta sorry. Hop off and go to another workshop. I'll see you. Oh, okay, Chris. Bye. Um, yeah, she's leading another SBIR workshop at noon. So she's going from workshop to workshop. Um, another thing to mention about the commercialization plan is that this is a mature program. It has been around for decades. The agencies really know what they want. And if you read the guidelines, that essentially serves as a template. They will tell you what to put in there. So look at the guidelines, read the guidelines carefully. It is a very well-written, very um, nicely detailed explication of what the agencies are looking for. All right, uh, Shelly, let's go ahead to the assignment. Um, as you think about how you're going to approach the proposal writing process on your team, I've provided one template that you can use for a timeline, but we're looking for a timeline in this assignment so that you can think about the steps that you need to take, who's going to do what, and when they're going to happen. And so submit the timeline, whatever format is convenient for you, Word document, Excel template, Google Doc, you know, whatever you like, submit it. But think through the main areas, the main milestones that you'll have, who's going to do them, and how the work itself is going to fall out. Give yourself a good week ahead of time before submission in your timeline, plan on submitting about a week before the actual deadline. So that's the only stricture I have. Um, I think that is uh, it. Any questions on assignments? Shelly, let's go ahead and look at what's coming up next week then. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. There are a couple other assignments too. They're pretty much self-explanatory. If you have any updates to your readiness checklist, make sure and get those up. I look at them each week. We see what's been new, what you've learned and how you've incorporated that and what has happened in the week with registrations, things are happening. Some companies are moving forward and it's nice to see that. And then as, as before, there's a study group review timeline or assignment. So you can look at the team readiness section from your study partner and give them comments. The comments were very astute, the previous assignment. So I, I repeated this assignment. I think that People have a very good understanding of what you're going through and getting some feedback from the peers is very useful. Next week, we will also review the assignments from this week as we've been doing every week, but we're gonna talk more about what it's like from a reviewer and we are gonna bring in yet another presenter, Annalisa Samara, who has a lot of experience with NIH and has run some companies herself as NIH. And uh, we're gonna talk about common pitfall pitfalls and mistakes to avoid. Chris is gonna say a little bit about selecting a review committee, you have actually some autonomy there or some freedom there. And I will be talking about formatting and graphics. This is also often overlooked in the uh, intense goal to get text squeezed down into six pages. There are some things you can do with formatting that will reduce the amount of text that you need. And I'm gonna go over some of those. And then uh, you know, we'll be at the end of the session and so what happens after that? We don't have a follow-up session scheduled per se, but there will be some resources available to you. And Shelley and Northwestern and University of Chicago will all talk about what resources they have in different areas to help support your work as you go along. So any other final questions before we call it quits for today? Rowling, can I ask you uh, maybe one clarification between uh, SBIR and STTR? Yeah. So uh, I wonder what's the big advantage, the disadvantage of each, if we are choosing one of them. Uh, for example, STTR is for, for people who are not so ready to the company side. No, no it's, it is the same program. It is the same guidelines. It is the same review criteria. The major difference between the two is the amount of work that the research institution does. With an SBIR proposal, the small business concern has to do at least two thirds of the work as measured by budget. Research institutions and consultants are restricted to less than a third. With STIR, the business has to do 40% of the work minimum, so that is less. And the research organization has to do at least 30% of the work. So the real difference that you need to be considering is how much work the research institution has to do. 
if you're going to rely heavily on a research institution and their lab, and that's going to result in half the work being done at the research institution, you have to go with STTR. Okay, thank you. That's, that's the nice. big difference. Yeah. The other difference is in the PIs. So I know before we were talking about co-PIs, this is the one area where you can have the co-PIs because you would have a PI from the research institution and a PI from the small business. So if you want you know, the research institution um, to have a PI, that, that is the ability to do that. But as Roland said, the biggest criteria I always say is what percentage everybody is gonna do. Right, so again, it's realism. What does the project really need? Now, sometimes you'll hear, hey, STTR is, um, you know, there are fewer STTR proposals written, so your odds are better. So if you can make it STTR, some people say SBIR is better because SBIR has more money in the program than the STTR program. And you can't predict ahead of time. Each time, each round, it'll be different. I have had people submit an STTR proposal and then NIH says, we can't fund this as STTR, but if you could accept an SBIR proposal instead and submit it as SBIR, we can fund it. There's a case where the program office wanted the work, they found a way to fund it. It was submitted as an STTR, they changed it to an SP, SBIR and they got funded. And that's so you, actually from the, um, the program perspective, the reviewers don't see the difference between an SBIR yeah. and STTR. They were reviewing them exactly the same. So both are submitted from the company, but the STTR could have a copy from the institution. Correct. Right. And, and in fact, with NIH, the institutional PI can be named the PI for the entire project. You have to specify one single PI for the application. Right. In most of the programs with the other agencies, the PI has to be with the company. But with NIH, the PI can be with the research institution if you're doing an STTR. Correct. Only if it's an STTR though. Right, right. If it's SBIR, the PI has to be with the company. Correct. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, thank you all for your questions. Uh, I look forward to working with you through the week. Make sure and sign up for office hours. If you have questions, we're glad to work with you and we will see you next week. <laughs>